This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Hello there, welcome to this edition of Global Business Africa. In the course of the hour, we'll run through the business news stories you need to know about on the continent and beyond. But first, a quick update from the markets that we do track here on the program. We'll talk about Safaricom in just a moment, but the market did seem to love the news coming out of Ethiopia. Its shares closed at least 2% higher in today's session, but it's still shy of record highs over 42 shillings 80 cents that was hit somewhere in late July. Many indices at the JC also closed higher today. They all share in the top 40, closed 4 tenths and 5 tenths of a percent higher. NASPERS, however, big move in that particular market. It's been in decline since February. On a year-to-date basis, it's down 11 Nigeria's main index ended the week 0.68% higher. Transcorp, Wanda Petroleum and Sterling Bank all accounted for the bulk of today's gains in the index. Here's what's coming up tonight. Kenya's safari comment is closer to bagging Ethiopia's lucrative mobile money market with M-Pesa. Rhino poaching is on the rise in South Africa's pandemic curbs are eased. And the United Kingdom expands its green list countries as travel during the COVID-19 pandemic starts to ease. Our starting point tonight is Ethiopia. Authorities over there have cleared the way for Kenya's telco, Safaricom, to introduce its M-Pesa mobile money service in a market of 110 million people. The authorities there have decided to include the mobile phone-based financial services in the telco's license that was offered in May. Now, that Safaricom license will be upgraded to include mobile financial services when it completes bidding for its second telecommunications operator permit. The bidding will be opened this month. A consortium led by Safaricom secured the first license, which does not have a permit for mobile financial services like M-Pesa, back in May. The consortium will start operations in 2022. The Ethiopian authorities say that the telco will have the right to operate mobile financial services in the country. On to another regional behemoth. Nigeria plans to launch its own cryptocurrency in October as a way of improving transactions and financial inclusion across the country. Now, this is coming barely seven months after the Central Bank of Nigeria banned all cryptocurrency transactions in the country. Here's CGTN's Phil Ihaza with the details from Abuja. It's normal for Nigerians to use cash. But that could be changing soon with the central bank's move to launch a new digital currency known as the e-Naira. Digital currency is what central banks all over the world, they are providing as an alternative to the current money arrangement. We think that this is a novel idea and we are not the first. We know the PBOC in China has unveiled theirs. And many other central banks are advanced stages of unveiling their own digital currency. And our own digital currency, which is tagged e-Naira, will certainly come into operation by the, grace, by, by the special grace of the Almighty by October. And we are working very hard. According to the CBN, Nigerians will be able to move some part of their money in local banks to a digitized wallet called the e-Naira, which they can spend anytime and anywhere around the world. It says this move will help financial inclusion, simplify payments, reduce the cost of international payments, and conserve foreign exchange earnings. But in February, Nigeria barred all banks and financial institutions from dealing in transactions involving cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. Maybe they are trying to find a way of getting people to embrace e-currency without going through the Bitcoin route. And this is particularly to ensure regulation because the crisis with uh, Bitcoin is about how do you regulate it? Nobody control it. Government cannot control it. Now, in era, digital currency is likely to have a legal framework that each national government will work on. So, while we are waiting for CBN to release full detail, I'm optimistic that um, because of high uh, internet penetration in Nigeria, our adaptation to uh, e-banking, we can cope. Nigeria is ranked 16th among countries most affected by internet crime in the world, according to the latest report by the U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation. And that's a concern that experts say the government will need to take seriously to combat cybercrime. Basically, when you focus on combating cybercrime, you need digital infrastructure. 
you need, if we have 220 million Nigerians, we should be able to, on the tap, know who we are, who we are. When there's any transaction, it should be traceable in case of crime. Of course, we also have to uh, now impute privacy cover so that uh, government will not use it to oppress the people. The government says that's something already in the works. The National Identity Management Commission says more than 60 million Nigerians have been duly captured and identified with a unique number. It plans to surpass the 100 million mark before the end of the year. With such plans in progress, Nigeria could be able to digitize its economy and improve transactions for businesses across the country. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja. Egypt's central bank kept its key policy rate essentially unchanged during its most recent monetary policy committee meeting held on Thursday. The committee kept the overnight lending rate at nine and a quarter percent, the overnight deposit rate at eight and a quarter percent, and that's happening for the sixth consecutive meeting. Remember, this comes after the bank cut rates back in September and November last year. Now, according to the central bank, headline inflation in Egypt went up to 4.9% in June from 4.8% in May, marginal increase there. The central bank says that the slight uptick in June is driven by higher prices of food items, and that actually accelerated food inflation to 3.4% in the month. In the meantime, annual non-food inflation fell to 5.6% in June from 6.3% in the month of May. That is the lowest number on record since June 2014. Back into East Africa now, a new commodity trade platform has been set up and it's running in Tanzania. The Tanzanian Mercantile Exchange is seeking to add even more crops to be traded through its commodity exchange. TMX, as it's more commonly known, is the first commodity exchange in Tanzania. It was established as a, as a platform where farmers, traders, exporters and other market actors will be able to access domestic and global market uh, players and obtain a fair price in selling or buying the commodities over the long run. The crops identified for expansion include coffee, cotton, lentils, cassava and peas as well. So what exactly does this expansion entail? Let's explore that. And Nicholas Casero is the Acting Director of Operations at the Tanzania Mercantile Exchange. He's joining us now live from Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Um, Nicholas, thank you very much for your time this evening. So coffee is one of the things that I know that you want to expand into, but Tanzania has a coffee exchange up north in Moshi as well. Weekly auctions are held there. So what's the unique value proposition that the mercantile exchanges bring to the table to farmers and other market actors? Well, thank you. The Commodity Exchange, Tanzania Mercantile Exchange, is going to add value by by increasing transparency because uh, the trading is going to be done through online whereby sellers will compete in selling their commodities wherever they are and buyers will compete to buy commodities wherever they are without needful to transport to transport it to the Moshi auction or to the regional auctions in the regions in the southern regions but also with the pandemic situation of COVID-19, people can stay wherever they are, but also to trade and get the commodities as they are. Uh, are these going to be spot contracts that you're offering, the, or are we going to offer a mix of spot contracts plus, of course, futures and forwards? With the Arabic, which is produced about 70% compared to 30% of Robusta, the the Arabic can be done with spot contract, but the Robusta will be done with futures, whereby farmers will bring in their estimate production and then traders will compete to buy in, 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 in payment and delivery to be done in the future. Okay, so roughly 90% of Tanzania's coffee comes from smallholder farmers, as I understand it. So how are you going to be dealing with quality control uh, among all the farmers that inevitably will be coming to market vis-a-vis -vis the roughly 10% or so of output that comes in from larger, more commercial operations? Currently, with the current budget, the government is investing in the extension services, whereby smallholder farmers will be supported with the extension officers to ensure that they produce by following best farming practices but also the warehouses receipt system, which ensures that quality crops are all 
received in the warehouses before being traded. This is done with the support of all stakeholders, including the Tanzania Coffee Board and also the Tanzania Mercantile Exchange to ensure that buyers, they get what they, they buy. Okay, um, so Tanzania displaced Kenya to become the third largest producer of coffee um, in the region, I believe. Um, what do you see, the, the, what's, what's, what's the outlook for yields for coffee, at least this year and the next? The, the production went to, uh, is increased to about 70,000 metric tons, but also with the inputs and government support which has been placed, is that it's about to increase to reach more of 90%, 90,000 metric tons, because the current average production is 50,000 metric tons per annum. Okay, some pretty decent numbers there. So cotton is also one of the other crops that you're keen on, on adding to the list of traded commodities at TMX. But cotton yields in the country are only now getting back to where they were in 2005, 2006. Can you give us a sense of the scale of demand for, for Tanzania's cotton compared to producers in West Africa and North Africa? Currently, with the Tanzania Cotton Board Statistics, Tanzania is producing about 0.6% of the world cotton, but 12% of the African cotton. With the model that we are introducing that is going to increase the demand of, we going to increase the income to farmers by 41%, and we are anticipating that this will increase, or will increase also the quality based with the government efforts and also will enable to increase the market share in the world, but also in Africa. So the model allows farmers to sell cotton lint, but also to sell seeds, which will increase their income by 41%. Okay, that so is the model we are anticipating with the commodity exchange. So when, when, when do we expect these contracts on, on cotton, on coffee, on cassava, on peas, when do these contracts come online? Currently, Tanzania Mercantile Exchange is working with the specific crop boards and the stakeholders involved in the value chain to make sure that this comes into, this comes into action. But this is done by studying the environment so that we do not disturb the, the, the current trade, so that when it, it starts to launch, it will launch in full. But we start with pilot, pilot, pilot phrases until when it comes to launch throughout in the, in, the, in, in the whole country. Okay, so pilot phases for now. Um, one last question for you very quickly. In order to essentially get these additional crops online, do you need to raise more capital to expand the warehouse network you have at the moment, or is your storage capacity as things currently stand? Is that sufficient? Currently, we are trading with what we have, the existing warehouses in the, in the country. But these warehouses need more improvement, but also they need more capacity in terms of size to enable the commodities that can be collected so that they can stay from time to time. But now what we do is that once commodities are stored, they are traded, they are taken out from the warehouses, and then other commodities comes in and trade, and then we trade. But if the regions or the, the, the zones can have strategic warehouses, then they'll help to, include, to, to, to collect more commodities in the warehouses before they trade. Now we trade as we receive in the warehouses to allow us to, to get space that would be used for another commodities to come in in the warehouses. All right, we'll leave it there for the time being. Nikolaus Kasserwe, Acting Director of Operations at the Tanzania Mercantile Exchange, joining us there live uh, from Dar es Salaam. And we're still in that East African country. Authorities in Tanzania are looking to improve the welfare of individual farmers in the country as a way of improving the performance of the agricultural sector as a whole. That's one of the key outcomes of a just concluded conference in the country's capital, which focused on trying to realize Tanzania's potential in agriculture and agro industry. CGTN's Isaac Lucando filed this report. We should 
shift from... This group of experts in agriculture want Tanzania to become a top agricultural exporter. This was top on the agenda at the 7th Annual Agricultural Conference at the nation's capital, Dodoma. Participants brainstormed on how the country's agricultural sector can achieve competitiveness. The government argues that this will only happen by raising the average monthly income for farmers, which currently stands at $43 a month. What we need is to create an environment where the work you do and the income you get is enough to live on. And the easiest way to ensure that those incomes are sufficient is to ensure that living costs go down, and the biggest living cost for many of our people is food. So increasing value in agriculture, the price of crops consumed in the country can go down, but incomes for farmers can increase. Export bans, bureaucracy and high costs of doing business with Tanzania's neighbors are some of the hurdles that have hampered the country's agricultural exports in recent years. The government says it is turning to information technology for solutions. The, the high tech, you know, the future of agriculture will be high tech. So the ministry focus on using ICT to solve most of the agriculture problems. So we have started doing digital registration of farmers. Uh, providing online facilities, agriculture trade management information system uh, that provide uh, areas where you can apply for export permit or phytosanitary certificate. Tanzania exported $1.8 billion worth of goods in the first quarter of 2020, the majority being agricultural products. A year later, this number has come down to $1.2 billion in part due to the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the United Nations, agriculture in Tanzania accounts for around 27% of the country's GDP. It provides livelihoods for 8 million households that are engaged in crop farming, livestock and fishing. Agricultural experts also argue that Tanzania is losing out on crucial income from farming for lack of value addition and proper branding of its produce. The number of countries that are utilizing SISO, they actually take it from Tanzania. They go and add value uh, to SISO either by mixing it with cotton or other raw materials and creating a variety of products. And these are sold, they are sold around the world and some of the products are even sold back to us. And it's quite a shame that we cannot... Um, We've not been able to, to, uh, to tap into that. The government's plan is to increase the nation's output, improve nutrition and boost incomes with every crop produced in the country. Isaac Lukando, CGTN, Dar es Salaam. Right, and let's make a quick run through some company headlines. Starting the world of tech, the ride-hailing company Bolt has raised over $716 million, increasing the company's valuation to $4.7 billion. Investors who took part in the most recent funding round include Sequoia Capital, Technique, Salo, G Squared, D1 Capital, and Naya. The firm will be using the funds to accelerate the expansion of its existing mobility and delivery products across the market that operates in, in Europe and here in Africa. Angla Gold Ashanti delivered first half headline earnings of $363 million amid a challenging first half of 2021. Performance, of course, was affected by the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. It increased costs, among other reasons. Headline earnings of $363 million, that's roughly 87 US cents a share in the first six months of 2021, compared to $404 million, or about 97 US cents a share in the first half of 2020. Adjusted net debt did decline by 41% year on year to $850 million as of 30th June, compared to $1.4 billion over the same period last year. Apple will be launching new software later this year that will analyze photos stored in a user's iCloud. Photos account for sexually explicit images of children and that will then be reported to relevant authorities. The move quickly raised concerns of its privacy advocates, however. As part of new safeguards involving children, the firm is also adding features to its Siri digital voice assistant to intervene when users search for related abusive material. And finally, Amazon has told its U.S. corporate staff not to return to the office until next year as COVID continues to spread. The online shopping giant previously asked staff to work from home until the 7th of September, but it's now extended that all the way to January the 3rd, 2022. This comes as new COVID infection surge across the United States with daily cases at an average not seen in months. 
Two U.S. financial institutions, Wells Fargo and BlackRock, also say they will push back their office return dates. That's a run through your headlines. You're watching Global Business Africa. Time for a short break. Here's what's coming up. The rhino poaching business is increasing in South Africa as pandemic restrictions are removed. And Zimbabwe's annual inflation has gone back into double-digit territory. We'll look at those numbers and plenty more when we come back. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. There's more to this place than just glorious landscapes. There's more to it than just, say, Table Mountain or glorious, endless salt flats. There's more to it than countries that are home to some of the deepest minds in the world. There is so much more to this place, even if it is home to some of the finest diamonds on the planet. It is the sheer diversity of the people who call South Africa home and the relentless drive to make it a better place that make it so special. And we know that because this too is home. No one knows South Africa like we do. CGTN, see the difference. Welcome back to the program. Let's focus on the business of poaching. The illegal poaching of rhino horn in South Africa is rising yet again. There was a marked decrease during the hard lockdown imposed in the country last year designed to curb the spread of COVID-19. But those pandemic restrictions have now been eased and poachers, it seems, are back on the hunt for horns. As CGTN's Sumitra Naidu now reports. South Africa's hard lockdown at the end of March last year brought the country to a near standstill. All movement was banned except for essential services. While this was devastating to the economy, it was a relief for rhino conservation. During the first hard lockdown that we had as a country, uh, we didn't experience any poaching incidents for close to about three months. And that was due to the fact that uh, there was no movement of goods out of South Africa. There was no movement of people as well. It was very restricted. And in the park, we only had essential workers. It was easier to spot anybody in the bush if they didn't belong there. Despite the reduction, there were still a few casualties. And with international travel slowly opening up, authorities are noticing a lot more activity on the ground. In the first six months of 2021, there has been an increase in rhino poaching compared to the first six months of last year, where only 166 rhino were poached. In the first six months of this year, we have very sadly lost 249 animals. This is less than the 318 that we lost in the same period in 2019. More measures are being put in place to curb the poaching. Safely dehorning rhinos has also helped to prevent rhino killings. What we have done also is to call in the South African National Defence Force. The border area is their competence. They are the ones who have to keep that safe from uh, intruders and from incursions. But unfortunately, uh, it is such a wide area and people do manage to come through. South African authorities are doing all they can to stop the rhino poaching, but poachers often find new ways of getting in. In the first six months of this year, Kruger Park has experienced 715 poacher incursions, an increase of approximately 4% compared to last year. The total number of rhino that we have lost in the Kruger Park 
in the first six months of this year is 132. The COVID restrictions and the limitations on the movement of people helped to save hundreds of rhinos. Unfortunately, a lot more needs to be done in order to keep this species from going extinct, especially now that international borders are reopening. Samish Ranadu, CGTN, South Africa. All right, then, so let's explore this in a bit more detail. Kadu Kiwes Bunya is the CEO of the African Wildlife Foundation. He's joining us now live on the program. Thank you for your time this evening, sir. Let's, let's start by putting some numbers to the problem. Um, last year, 394 rhinos were slaughtered by poachers, but do we have an idea of how many have been killed so far this year? Yes, recent reports from South African government indicate that from January to the end of June to this year, uh, two, about 249 rhinos have been poached for their horns, higher than the number of rhinos killed uh, in the same period last year. Uh, but at least this year is much less than the number of rhinos killed pre-COVID, which was 318. The trend is indeed concerning, uh, and the illegal offtake of this is unsustainable. So what horn... this simply means... Right. is that uh, we need to stop that demand. So rhino horn, of course, is one of those commodities that tend to be consumed far, far away from where they're actually sourced. A lot of, this, uh, a lot of these consumers, of course, are across Asia. But given pandemic restrictions around the world, what are we seeing on that side of the market? Did that scarcity force prices up? Yes, or is that, that's what's happened is with, with the markets. But we don't know exactly what the price is today. My suspicion is that because of COVID and restrictions of travel and closing of borders, the price probably has gone high. Uh, but it's very troubling. Uh, the shift of the illegal wildlife is increasingly uh, for the demand uh, outside. We are seeing it now moving on internet with a pandemic closing down travel. Illegal wildlife products are on sale on the dark web. And that's why at AWF, we have now counter wildlife department that deals with cyber crime Wait, and prosecutorial so, management. Hang on. So I can go online into the dark web using, say, a browser like Tor, perhaps, and actually find someone who's selling rhino horn or pangolin scales, elephant tusks, that sort of thing. That's where this trade has moved on to. Absolutely. And just last week uh, in a country I want to name because it's still premature. We are going after the middle guys. We found a sale of uh, ivory and pangolin, pangolin scales on the dark web. And we've just been working now with Interpol to get the bad guys uh, apprehended and the sailors uh, in the, from this country. Yes, it's, it's, it's worrying, but the ultimate aim is to succeed, is to stop the killing, stop the poaching and trafficking, and then stop the demand. But the demand, once it stops, the killing will stop. Okay, the demand but, is the main factor. But conservation budgets are essentially strained uh, pretty much across the continent because governments are struggling to fund even basic services, healthcare, education, transport, security, that sort of thing. So in that sort of environment, what, what can parks uh, and conservancies do to limit uh, the, the damage poachers are inflicting on herds? Yeah, a couple of things. Of course, from the revenue side, the tourism industry needs to be supported to rebuild back but it has to rebuild back better uh, in terms of who is involved. Domestic tourism needs to be increased. Reliance on our international arrivals, as we've seen, is not sustainable. So the industry needs to change. Tourism has been funding almost 70% of conservation uh, across, across the continent. But also the conversation needs to change. The way conservation has been discussed with governments and others. Because conservation is not only about protecting wildlife. Conservation is about protecting water sources we need for our food security. Conservation is about health, the zoonotic diseases. Uh, we are spending a lot of money on vaccines but we can spend less on conservation to keep the viruses in the world, in the world lands and on world life. So we need to start a different conversation to have a different sources of funding for biodiversity and, and conservation, because it's a source of water, it's, it supports our agriculture in terms of soils, in terms of pollination, it's a food security issue, it's a, a cross-boundary issue, so it increases uh, transboundary a relationship and diplomacy. We need to discuss about our industry so different 
from just about protecting wildlife. Is, is, a problem the perhaps, is, a pro is a problem perhaps the way it's being phrased? Because as you pointed out in the past, 70% of the revenues uh, funding conservation came in from tourism. International markets essentially cut off uh, the Kenyan uh, tourism CS was talking about a recovery in 2024. That's a fairly long time out. Is a problem that we've not explained to local citizens who are in constant wild, uh, conflict with wildlife that, look, it's in your interest to essentially conserve these ecosystems? Absolutely. It's, we haven't been, and that's the problem with, the, with us conservationists. We've always been taken as just tree huggers, that our industry is all about foreign, foreigners wanting to see wildlife on the continent. But if you look at it, it's all about the ecological infrastructure that we support as conservationists. That's absolutely essential for the aspirations of Africans, whether it's economic, whether it's health, whether it's food security, whether it's just water for our towns and urban centers. Conservation is life. It's not about wildlife. Wildlife plays a major role in maintaining the ecosystem that supports the ecological services we need for us to survive. But also the one thing that we talked about rhinos, one thing about poaching, it's just as we need to understand that conservation management is just a diligent environmental stewardship and it's a fairly reliable proxy for broader good governance. Animals like rhinos are important because the death of wildlife also tells us the story and a good indicator how us as Africans we are managing or failing our resources or the future of this continent. So it's just a proxy indicator. The failure to police protected forests against illegal loggers, for example, or wildlife in parks against poachers, is just an, an idea of dysfunction that ends in bushes. It's, it's an indicator that often expresses itself in a failure to deal with crime on the streets right. in our cities. Okay, understood. So it's just well, a, a, a link between as we manage ourselves as human, human rights, but also as animal rights. Right, got it. It's essentially the broken windows theory at work. I've just extrapolated to a much, uh, a much bigger application. Um, we'll leave it there for the time being. Kadu Kiwe Sebunya, CEO of the African Wildlife Foundation. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you for having me. Now let's head over to Zimbabwe. Annual inflation over there has gone back, thankfully, into double-digit territory for the first time in two years. Inflation figures for July, 56.37%, compared that to 106% that we had back in June. Sujitian so Farai Mokutuya has the details from Harare. From a peak of 837.5% in July 2020, Zimbabwe's inflation has been on a steady descent, dropping to 56.37% in July this year. Authorities claim the slowdown is due to fiscal reforms, but some believe the figures are not a true reflection of reality due to the COVID-19 pandemic. That downward pressure on inflation is just because business is slow. There's no business at the moment. So what we have is a reflection of yesterday's prices because we are still looking at yesterday's uh, stock where still there's not enough consumption for even businesses. Are not, some are not even in operation at the moment. The statistics also do not take into account the structure of the economy. 76% of employment is now informal. The informal economy is contributing 62% to GDP. So a lot of the developments that are taking place in the informal economy are hidden from, from, from these official uh, numbers. That's why some here believe the country is not out of the woods just yet as it faces several downside risks. Among them, increased wage demands from public servants, a foreign currency black market, and growing government debt. All these mean there's more to do, especially if citizens are to start feeling the difference. We may reach 30% for 50% uh, by year end, but again, uh, it's neither here nor there because already we are saying prices in Zimbabwe are on the very high side. And uh, as long as they are on the very high side, it means uh, competitiveness is affected, productivity is affected, and return on investment is affected, and that affects our, our investment outlook. So yes, we are celebrating uh, this slowdown. It's good. We need to maintain the momentum, but I think there's still a lot of challenges that we need to grapple with. We need to continue with um, uh, mandatory prudence. We need to institute more institutional reforms uh, around the parastatals uh, because government still continues to subsidize. We need, I think, to also manage our, our, our debt levels. 
Zimbabwe Central Bank has forecast annual inflation to slow down to 25% by year end. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN, Harare, Zimbabwe. It's time for a short break. You're watching Global Business Africa. Here's what's coming up. The UK expands its green list countries as travel during the COVID-19 pandemic starts to ease. And we'll hear how Iran's new administration intends to tackle a crippling economic crisis in the Middle Eastern oil producer. It's exciting. It's new. It's different. It's a challenge. It's really exciting. <laughs> Over the last 14 hours of rain. Business in Africa is at a crossroads. We celebrate those who are adopting and thriving despite the challenges, from grassroots to big businesses. Global Business takes you along for the ride as we track the making of a giant. Only on CGTN. And welcome back to the program. These are some of the stories making your headlines at this hour. Starting in Nigeria, the United Nations is warning of an impending famine in the country's northeast. The United Nations World Food Program says 8.6 million people are facing food shortages in Nigeria's northeast alone. And many of them cannot cultivate their farms due to the insurgency that's been running for at least a decade now by Boko Haram. The former president of South Africa, Jacob Zuma, has been admitted to an undisclosed hospital. In a statement, the Department of Correctional Services says the 79-year-old is undergoing a routine medical observation. As former head of state, Mr. Zuma is treated at, uh, at a military facility outside Escort Prison, where he's currently serving a 15-month jail term. Mr. Zuma snubbed a commission that is probing state corruption, which is pretty endemic during his presidency. And the Tunisian president is calling for the lowering of prices of medicines as a North African nation battles the COVID-19 pandemic. This comes after President Kai Saeed implemented wide-ranging political measures designed to appease citizens following recent protests in the country. That's a run through your headlines. Let's head outside the continent now. The UK government has issued its latest amendments to its international COVID travel policies in a bid to boost overseas summer holidays. Seven countries have been added to its so-called green list, meaning essentially that no quarantines are required upon arrival from those countries. But the travel sector and opposition politicians say there's still too much confusion and uncertainty in how this list is working. CGTN's Paul Barber has this report from London. From Sunday, travellers arriving into the UK from France, many of them on Eurostar trains coming into the terminal here at St Pancras International Station, will no longer have to quarantine at home for 10 days. That's because France has been taken off the government's so-called Amber Plus list for international travel. Another holiday hotspot, Spain, has been kept on the Amber list despite concern over the beta strain of Covid moved on to amber and off the red list those countries which require special hotel quarantine for 10 days include india qatar and the united arab emirates mexico has been put on red seven countries are now on the green list germany austria norway and romania among them the lists won't be reviewed for another three weeks which the transport secretary says balances caution with a level of relaxation that holidaymakers can enjoy for the rest of August. 
you can never say zero chance with coronavirus. But uh, having said that, um, the levels of vaccination and uh, what we now know about the uh, virus and what our scientists have been able to uh, work out in, in the last year uh, means that people should be able to go away, enjoy their holidays without looking over their shoulders the whole time. It is indeed welcome news for the beleaguered travel sector, but they say there is still too much uncertainty around how the government makes its decisions. There's progress here and it's to be welcomed that some countries are opening up further, but it's still a complicated traffic light system. It doesn't go far enough in widening the list of green countries. There are many countries eligible to be green. And it doesn't address one of the key issues that consumers have, which is around the lack of notice before a country changes colour. Now, France was only put onto that Amber Plus list three weeks ago, which shows just how quickly the situation can change. And while vaccinated vacationers may be able to enjoy a measure more of freedom this summer, if we've learned anything this year, it's that coping with COVID means predictions are impossible to make. Paul Barber, CGTN, London. The US President Joe Biden has issued an executive order to cut greenhouse gas emissions. And through the order, Mr. Biden wants half of all new vehicles sold in the United States to be electric by 2030. And the move has found support from big U.S. car makers. The administration has proposed new vehicle emission standards that would cut pollution through 2026, starting with a 10% increase in fuel efficiency for the 2023 model year. Iran is experiencing a deep economic crisis, mainly caused by crippling U.S. sanctions. The country's new administration will take office later this month. But expectations are high as people hope to see the economy rebound and the pressures eased. Esin Kevani reports from Tehran. After spending eight years of harsh economic pressures during President Rouhani, the Iranian nation is waiting for a new president to take office. Raisi, who has vowed huge reforms in industry and economy, as well as his promised fight against state corruption, will inherit an economy with an inflation of 43 percent, unemployment rate at 10 percent, and economic growth at less than 1 percent. The main reasons for the current stricken economy are years of sanctions and the country's inability to sell oil in the international markets plus poor performance in the industry sector by the recent administrations. But can people be optimistic about the new administration's moves? We must alleviate people's concerns and relieve their pain and suffering by relying on the current possibilities and our great young workforce. We must turn frustration into hope. Many experts believe a boost in the country's economy could be expected, but such hope depends on some fundamental factors. So people would like the economy to improve. They obviously want more jobs, higher income and lower inflation. But I think there are two major factors that, we de that will determine the economic trajectory over the next four years. The first one is the U.S. and Iran negotiations over the revival of the JCPOA. And the second one, which I think is as important, is how the new government will form its economic team. Raisi's economic priorities include harnessing inflation, boosting economic growth, and increasing non-petroleum exports. However, each of these goals require fundamental actions as well as favorable political conditions. Despite all the obstacles in the way of the president-elect to reconstruct Iran's economy, Iranian people hope they can experience higher purchasing power and better living standards. Ehsan Keivani, CGTN, Tehran, Iran. On to Venezuela. Authorities have announced plans to slash six zeros off its inflation-battered currency, the Bolivar, to make it a lot easier to use. Now, that change will take effect on the 1st of October, the issuance of new notes, and this essentially will be called the Digital Bolivar. Remember, this is the third time in 13 years that Venezuela, which is currently suffering the worst economic crisis in its modern era, has used this measure. Stephen Gibbs reports from Caracas. It was only last March that Venezuela launched a new series of notes, including this one million Bolivar bill. 
but relentless inflation means already it's only worth 25 cents. So the government is starting again, knocking six zeros off each of its notes, meaning one million becomes one. This country in hyperinflation since 2016 has been here before. In fact, in the last 13 years, it has twice relaunched its currency, lopping a total of eight zeros off previous banknotes. The new currency will be called the Digital Bolivar. The government says it will be encouraging digital transactions, but will also print physical notes. In recent years, Bolivars in cash have all but disappeared here, and US dollars are widely used for everyday transactions. We went onto the streets of Caracas and asked people what they made of the government's latest move. This man first made it clear he trades in any currency. But he said fewer zeros was a good thing. It will make purchasing quicker, he said. They should have done it earlier, said this man. He complained that calculators couldn't handle the huge numbers used for basic transactions. But there were some real skeptics too. This woman said the problem was she earns in bolivars but pays for things in dollars. Things will be the same or worse, probably worse, she said. Economists say that repeatedly removing zeros from a currency, while practical, really only tackles the symptom and not the problem. The reconversion won't make the Bolivar stronger or weaker. The Bolivar's purchasing power depends on government policy, not the number of zeros on a note. The consensus view is that to decrease inflation, the government will have to increase productivity and show restraint in printing money. The Maduro government, which blames US sanctions for many of its economic woes, says this move is part of an effort to recuperate its economy and recover, it hopes, people's trust in their national currency. Stephen Gibbs, CGTN, Caracas. Despite the coronavirus pandemic, one of the world's largest cybersecurity conferences, Black Hat, is taking place in Las Vegas. This year, it's part in person and part virtual. As Mark Lee reports, one of the key foes experts have set the sights on is dismantling ransomware. While medical experts scramble to control a pandemic, tech experts at the Black Hat conference take on viruses of another kind. These are the most technically adept people in the world in terms of securing our enterprises. So what they say to us in terms of what, what matters, what keeps them up at night, is very, very telling. At the event, the antivirus company Trend Micro released its Cyber Risk Index, which shows that the least prepared regions for attack are North America, followed by the Asia Pacific. At the top of the threat list is ransomware, a cybercrime where criminals steal data and then demand payment for its return. The ransoms they're asking now for a, from an organization are upwards in the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that we've seen. So certainly it is, an, it is a threat that is, is very uh, difficult to deal with, be partially because ransomware is actually the end of the attack. There's usually a number of steps prior to the ransomware being deployed in the organization. So they're going to be in there for a, for a period of time and they're probably stealing data from you. Many security experts compare ransomware to a cancer. Early detection is crucial for the long-term health of the patient. All attacks need to get inside your organization and do something. They need to discover what is really important in your organization. And that takes time. If you're able to detect that attack during that phase, you're able to avoid the damage of the actual detonation of the ransomware. Security companies like NetWitness use artificial intelligence to scour through massive amounts of data to detect abnormalities that could be signs of an attack. This cyber map from Kaspersky Labs shows the startling number of ransomware attacks that take place in a single day. I do want to encrypt specific business data. Right? This live demonstration is with the tool Racketeer, which allows companies to implant a controlled ransomware campaign inside their own systems to test how they respond. 
Data analyst Tanner Johnson is spreading the message that all companies need to have a plan to deal with an attack. It's the challenge of drilling into people's heads just how severe this threat really is of ransomware. You have organizations now are being forced to their entire future of their business operations now depend upon the honor amongst thieves. And paying a ransom is not an immediate solution as well. It doesn't guarantee you access to your data. It doesn't guarantee that the decryption key provided even works. It just means you've made that payment. Um, and sadly often results in you being put on a white list for a future campaign six, 18 months down the road. Johnson says ransomware attacks along with the COVID-19 pandemic have stretched the resources of many companies. But he says it's still vital they determine the most valuable components of their business in order to prioritize their protection and avoid being thrown into chaos in the event of a cyber attack. Mark New, CGTN, Las Vegas. All right, then, uh, let's make a quick run through commodity prices, uh, shall we? Spot platinum prices went under $1,000 an ounce today, hitting 982.54 uh, to around 16.30 GMT. It's been a pretty rough week, really, for this particular precious metal. It's fallen by 6.6% in the last five trading sessions to the 2021 lows that we're seeing now today. On the agricultural side, September futures down about eight tenths of a percent, well off the highs of about $210 that were hit uh, in late July. But even in these levels, coffee futures are up by nearly a third so far this year. Brent crude uh, it's having a fairly dismal week, down 6% since Monday, $70.86 uh, a barrel at 16.35 GMT. To a large extent, that's a reflection of concerns about this recent wave of COVID, uh, COVID infections rather eroding demand both now and in the medium term. Here's what's coming up next. Despite sitting on a notion of natural gas, LPG prices are soaring once again in Nigeria. Africa is a continent of diversity, with varied climate and enchanting geography, and a people so distinct, but with a shared enduring spirit. We are at the heart of the continent, to bring you the untold stories. Let's have a look. We celebrate Africa as it shapes its own destiny. Shirushi, Tunis, Cairo, Juba, Johannesburg, Ethiopia, Tanzania. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. A pair of stories from Nigeria for the final part of the bulletin. The first one focuses on energy. The price of LPG has gone up significantly in several African countries. Kenya and Nigeria recently affected price increases for cooking gas. It's a move that may force users to turn to alternatives with much higher carbon emissions like charcoal, kerosene and firewood, but lower price tags amid high unemployment and poverty levels in these countries. Both gas sellers and gas users in Nigeria are struggling. As the GTN's Deji Badmus finds out. It's the peak period of sales at this gas plant, but there are no customers. The manager of the gas plant says sales has dropped drastically since the price of gas in the country was suddenly jacked up three weeks ago. Presently, the price of uh, gas is 454 naira per kg. You know? So when you want to buy 12.5 kg now, that's about 5,700 approximately. And that's on the high side because the complaints, the, the, the feedback we are getting from customers is not, um, it's not something to, to, to be happy about. But then what do you do? I use gas at home too, so I know how it feels. It hurts, you know. My pocket hurts, you know. So if my pocket should hurt, that of the customer too will also hurt. Some customers like petty trader Oluato Senakin Remy are still managing to put up with the hike in price. But she says she has had to make some drastic adjustments. So I was using 12.5. I couldn't, because I cannot afford the price, so I have to go and buy a, this a half of it, 6 kg. Now, 6 kg is 3,000. So the thing is really affecting me, and there's no how you can do without cooking. Restaurant owner Yu Ugoya is still using gas for her cooking, but she says she's already planning to switch over to charcoal. 
Let me try Sako for one week. If I buy one bag of Sako, then I will now compare it with uh, gas. Brother, and I believe gas, the uh, Sako is even better now, not even need of. The gas is going up every day, every day. Some other local restaurant owners have since abandoned gas for firewood and not making any plans to make a U-turn. The smoking disturbs this me This smoke lot. disturbs me a lot. It affects my eyes and my lungs. It also disturbs my neighbor. Sometimes they complain about the smoke, but I usually plead for their patience. I just cannot help it. Apart from the issues of climate change, Medical experts say the use of firewood also poses serious health hazard. And with the increasing price of gas, more people like Abba are likely to turn to firewood. We do know, for example, that uh, when you incinerate uh, firewood and you burn it and use it as a cooking uh, fuel, you tend to produce uh, over 200 different chemicals. Prominent, of course, is carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, and a couple of other chemicals. The issues with these chemicals is that they are almost as pungent and as dangerous to health as the normal and the usual cigarette smoke we talk about. Nigeria consumes an estimated 1 million metric tons of cooking gas annually, even though the country is a major gas producer, it still imports about 65% of what it consumes as local production of cooking gas is still very low. High cost of foreign exchange as a result of devaluation is mainly responsible for the hike in the price of gas. Dejibadmos, CGTN, Lagos, Nigeria. Right, then a quick run through the currency. So there was some initial jitters in the dollar rand cross after the exit of uh, Tito Mboweni, South Africa's finance minister, and the shuffle that happened uh, yesterday at around 9 p.m. local time in South Africa. But it appears investors are comfortable uh, with this replacement, Enoch Godongwana. The rand was about eight tenths of a percent lower at 1637 GMT, 1462 against the dollar. But even at those levels, the rand really hasn't given up its gains against the greenback so far in 2021. The big question, of course, is should we expect policy continuity or does Mr. Godongwana have something different to bring to the table as far as right size in South Africa's economy is concerned? We'll find out and update you. But that's it for this edition of Global Business Africa. As always, we'd like to hear your thoughts on the content you've seen on the program in the last hour. Many ways to get your thoughts back to us. All of them are on your screens right now. I'm Raman Yang in the Kenyan capital, Nairobi. Thank you for your company in the last hour. The World Today is up next from Washington, D.C.